My name is Olga Filinchu. I'm head of business development at Goethe for Europe, Asia Pacific and Africa. And uh, today I'm going to have a training together with my colleague Anastasia Yurojo. She's head of marketing at Goethe. And today we're going to speak about seminars and conferences and all, all the organizational stuff. Um, basically here on this slide you could see the initial name that we picked. Uh, that's considered to be a funny one. Uh, you know, there is a joke that organizing conferences is super easy. It's as if you're riding a bike. Only the bike is on fire, you are on fire, everything around you is on fire, and you're in hell. So this was uh, the funny name of the presentation, then we changed it to the traditional one. And my clicker is not working again. Okay, so this is the official name that we're going to use. Today we're going to speak why organizing seminars and conferences could be a powerful business development and marketing tool. But before we start this kind of training, um, I would really love to all of us to engage a bit more, to wake up, since it's already 3 or 4 p.m., and um, discuss what is the difference between selling a service and selling a product. I know that many of you visited the training uh, of Dennis Grebenikov or Anastasia's training earlier today, so perhaps some of you have the answers. So I would appreciate some bold thoughts from the audience. What's the difference between selling a service and selling a product? What do you think? Anyone? Okay, Milan, help me. What is the difference? No, really, you're the marketeer. Well, it's different. You're it isn't different. It is different. It is different. How is it different? It is a different product. <laughs> <laughs> Depends, is it service or, or, or product? C could somebody help? I'm <laughs> in a bad situation. Thank you, Samir. Okay, Murtada is ready. Oh, Mr. Samir. <laughs> product needs storekeeper. <laughs> Service don't need that. Huh? Okay. Any more and ideas? For, for us, we get money from both. And we, we, we make both together in one package. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sell product only without service. Also, I could not sell service without product. That's right. an interesting idea. I agree. Okay. Also, Mr. Samir? Product usually is something you can touch feel, interact with. Service is totally different story. Thank you, Mr. Samir. I agree with you. So um, here on this slide, you could see some basic differences, and it's uh, super close to what Mr. Samir has just explained. When selling a product, the persona of a salesperson uh, or a professionalism of a salesperson is not that important. The product has definite characteristics. And for example, when you decided you want to buy a Mercedes, you know that you want a Mercedes. And the question where to buy it or who to buy it from is kind of secondary. At the same time, when you're selling a service, that's a completely different story. You would rely on such subjective things sometimes as referrals of customers or your friends or the reputation of a service provider. And again, the service is something you cannot feel, you cannot touch, you cannot smell, and you cannot evaluate it unless you try it for a long period of time. And again, you cannot try it for a long period of time if you do not pay for it. So it's all kind of tricky. This is the main difference. Also, some smart people say that it's possible to sell a complex product or a complex service through such things as training, education, and help. For example, when you are educating your potential target audience, you're not actually selling, you're helping them, and help really looks pushy. And here comes uh, the question, how to start a seminar? Let's imagine that a seminar is a unique opportunity to help your target audience to educate it. How to start? We always say start with a goal. You need to have a clear idea why you're having a seminar in the first place. Especially if this is something you spend money on, then you should have a very, very clear goal. Goal is a certain thing, a strategic thing that will set up a direction for the whole event. And uh, goals could be different. Here on this slide, you could see some more or less frequent and common goals that we identify, but it could be more than that. 
For example, you want to build a pool of loyal customers or you want to increase uh, or improve the understanding of your products within your dealer's chain. Or you want to make your customers stay longer and pay more to you or pay more often and stuff like that. One more question and I hope you will again help me. What do you think is the difference between a goal and an objective? Anyone? Any ideas? That's a nice allegory, I suppose, Milan. Can you repeat to the microphone? No. <laughs> Okay, me, I'm kind of skipping that part of the audience. Guys, maybe you can help me here. Dennis, you're not allowed to help me because you know the correct answer. <laughs> yes, it's unfair. You're, you're too smart for that training. Urish, maybe you could help me. Sorry? Well, goal would be more tangible. Mm hmm You think so? Uh huh. More okay. specific. Mm hmm And objective? Less tangible. <laughs> okay, nice guess. I will not torture you anymore. Uh, objective is actually a tactical thing you can measure after the event finishes. Again, your objective could be something you can measure. For example, you want to have five media publications after the event, or you want to attract ten new customers. If we think carefully about it, you're not making the seminar or the conference to get just five media publication, publications, right? Uh, this is your objective. Your main goal, again, could be to build your community, to educate your dealers and stuff like that. So I would really want us to uh, remember this difference because later on we'll get back to it. When we're speaking about seminars as a way to educate your customers, as a way to prepare your customers to pay more and pay more often, um, we should also carefully think about the content you prepare for your seminar. Again, here comes the tricky part. Advertisement of your services is not value, and uh, speaking or listening to your customers how great you are is not value either. And content is worth listening to only if it's valuable content. How to identify if that's valuable? A simple question should be asked. Does my content provide value? If it's not, then you're having an advertisement-specific seminar, and most of the people will not be able, will not be willing to spend the whole day listening to advertisement stuff. So um, we have a couple of ideas with Anastasia. We came up with potential topics for your one-day seminar. We want to work with you together and try to identify if those are good titles for your presentations or not. So again, I would expect some assistance from your side. Here is the first topic, which you can speak about and your one-day seminar, for example. It's uh, how to meet, motivate your drivers for cooperation and turn them into your best friends after implementing a monitoring solution. So doesn't sound like a potentially quality content to you or not? It's uh, how to motivate your drivers for cooperation and turn them into your best friends after implementing a tracking solution. Bad or good? Okay, raise your hands those who think it's, it's good. Uh-huh. Okay, Murtada. Yeah. Basically, I'll tell you what our scenario. When we install the device, we tell it's for your protection. Maybe you you know, it's uh, our, our country, Iraq, is not safe. Mm -hmm. so maybe car in the road taken suddenly. So we tell them it's, it's for your safety. And uh, if you are good, the company will know you are good. You are the best. Something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what can do. But almost you not believe us, but what <laughs> you have to do. <laughs> okay, in every country you have quite specific challenges and business issues you're coping with. 
Okay, half of the audience uh, voted that that could be a good content, and other part of the audience probably thinks that's a bad content and doesn't have any opinion yet. So, to our mind, that could be pretty quality content because here it specifies a certain problem which businesses may experience. For example, I, I don't think that I have to explain it to all of you. Uh, when implementing a tracking solution, most of the drivers will not be happy about it. Some of them will leave their jobs, some of them will try to sabotage it. So, here this title signifies a certain potential problem and it also shows there's some kind of resolution to that problem. There is a way to avoid that and even turn your drivers to your friends. Who knows? Next one. That's a short one. New services of our company and why you need them. Do you think your seminar participants would love to listen to that kind of topic? Milan says yes. Milan would love to listen to it. Any other opinions from that part of the audience, maybe? Okay, raise your hands those who think that's quality content. Okay, one, two, three. Java here, did not expect it from you. <laughs> okay, um, to our mind, this is uh, the type of topic you should like closely work on. We don't think that's a good content. I mean, for a pool of your loyal customers, those who work with you already, that might be an interesting topic to listen to because they know who you are and they want to probably know what else you have to offer, how they can benefit more from your cooperation. But for new customers, that might look or sound a bit too spammy and I think they're going to pass in most cases. And the last one, I swear. Optimization of fuel expenses and top five things you could do for your organization on the money you saved. Good or bad? Raise the hand. Or, Mr. Simir, you have a comment? You think it's good? Yeah, can you please explain why you think it's good? Anything that represents in, uh, figures, values, charts, mm -hmm. would uh, attract interest in any client. This mm -hmm. is my opinion. Thank you. And you use the fuel expenses. That's the key word these days. Yeah, I agree with you. Any other opinions from the audience? from that part? No? Okay, again, raise the hand those who think that's quality content. Okay, so the answer is to our mind both yes and no. We're not sure ourselves yet. Um, to be honest with you, I voted that this is a good, this could be a good presentation. Anastasia and Dennis had a different kind of opinion and I kind of, kind of agree with it right now. It's good because, again, it specifies a certain problem. There is some fuel expenses that we need to take into account and we need to work on them. At the same time, the second part of this topic could sound a bit controversial because people normally do not like when you teach them how they should spend their money. So I think that could be a nice topic, but we need to work on it a bit more. For example, even if you call it like optimization of fuel expenses and top five things, how other organizations spend money uh, from that kind of solution, that would sound a bit more neutral and that would help uh, to shift the focus from the organization on somebody else's. Again, one last thing before we go further. Content should be quality with no exceptions. Otherwise, uh, your seminar would not probably be that successful as you want it to be. There are also some other challenges that we hear about when we speak about organizing conferences and seminars. First of all, that it's difficult. Second of all, that it's also expensive. And thirdly, that uh, all the people and money resources and time resources associated with the preparation of the seminar are totally not worth it. They're not worth the, the result. But today we have Anastasia with us and she's going to explain, is it really so? Is, are those real challenges or are there just obst obstacles that we can work on and fight easily? Exactly, Olga. So, basically, in my opinion, the good thing is that an, uh, the process of the organization of the event can be really bur uh, riding a burning bicycle. But at the same time, you can have a strategy, you can have a set of definite steps, uh, you follow them, and you are the winner. So, uh, my task is to tell you what are these stages specifically. And basically, there are only six of them. 
So first of all, you are setting up the goal and the format. Then you are organizing the team. Then you are uh, determine, determining a budget. Then you are finding the venue uh, and the contractors. Then you are specifying the program. And finally, inviting the participants. And all this time, you are bearing in mind that you will have a certain uh, bunch of risks. So let's have a deep dive into all the stages of this brilliant process. Uh, during my presentation, I will focus on a one-day seminar because it's an absolutely manageable event. So I totally believe that everyone from this audience uh, can easily organize a one-day seminar, especially after this presentation. So, uh, the, concept, the concept and the timeline. Olga has already told you about the goals and the objectives, uh, but what about the content and the uh, concept? Uh, before you think about uh, the organizing an event, you need to bear in mind four things. So, first of all, uh, possibility to manage the project. So, do you have enough resources? Do you have enough time? Do you have enough uh, people to organize the event? Budget restrictions. So, is it, uh, do, will you have enough money or do we need to optimize the budget? And by the way, uh, I will tell you about the budget optimization a little bit later. The next one is the amount of people you have. Uh, because sometimes it can happen that um, you can, for example, uh, book a great venue for uh, 2,000 of people, I don't know, to invite all of them, and finally understood that there is nobody to deal with them. There is nobody to organize the event. We don't want this situation to happen. And the last one is time restrictions. So it's about time you have, because time is also a valuable resource. Uh, just imagine, we plan our telematics conference one year in advance. Uh, and basically, the most active part of the organization starts in 1.5 months. So um, pretty much time, but uh, bear in mind that we have the separate department. And all in all, there are 70 people dealing with this telematics conference. Yeah, so that's the proof. Uh, but uh, it's my opinion that uh, one day seminar without a dedicated marketing team, you need two months maximum to organize it. So it's absolutely doable. Uh, a very important thing uh, to bear in mind is the date. So you open the calendar, you take the red pen, and you cross, you start to cross. You cross official holidays. That's a bad idea to have an uh, event during the official holidays. Holiday season. Yeah, I know that we are doing telematics in August. But we have some obstacles because we have like 12 more events in our calendar, so we had to do this. So that's why thank you once again for those who did it to Minsk. Uh, you also cross the dates of the major events like Super Bowl final or major exhibitions because we expect that your audience will be there. Mondays, also not the best one. Uh, and the situation when you have less than two months, so uh, you are super short in time. Uh, it's a good idea when the concept becomes the document. So you open the uh, doc or Excel sheet uh, and try to figure out what will your event look like? What is the audience? So what is the ideal event you would like to have? Uh, and then you do the timeline. So basically, if you're doing a one-day seminar, the timeline can look like this. So uh, the decision in the work group uh, you can specify it three months before the event. Uh, allocation of the resources, so with the budget and people, uh, date in the four months. I would say 2.5 months in advance. Uh, booking the venue, program and speakers, and also landing page or another means of communication, and I will uh, certainly talk about this later. It's about two months prior to the event. Uh, thinking about the participants, invitation process, contractors, and buying the souvenirs, especially if you order them from China, so it's 1.5 months prior to the event. Uh, then you, uh, then you um, made uh, a flow of communication for the media, so you communicate with the journalists, then you do the printed materials, and then you once again repeat the flow of communication for the journalists. Uh, and do the last preparations three days prior to the event. So then you have the day X, uh, and then uh, you think about the results and you're doing the post-release. Uh, the second very important thing is the team. Um, these are the tools that we're using for teamwork here in Gurtum. So we use 
very simple instruments. The Google Drive to store all the information and share it with, between the team members, uh, the Google Calendar, a dedicated email group, chat and messengers, uh, and the task managers you are used to. So it can be Redmine, Slack, Trello, or whatever. Uh, the third step is the budget. Uh, here are the budget issues you will probably have, so it's definitely the venue and it will be a big one. Uh, but also bear in mind that projectors, microphone and silence monitor should be uh, or can be uh, um, charged separately, so that is why it may be two uh, budget issues. Food and beverages, it's also and always the biggest part of the budget. A participant's package, here I mean all these printed materials and souvenirs, everything. The photograph, transfer or representative, representative expenses, uh, and the landing page. Uh, and other expenses, of course. So probably you will have the first three for the small event. Uh, but the situation may occur that you've calculated everything, even the three uh, budget items, and you understood that you don't have enough money. So that's a possible situation, right? What should we do here? There are basically four steps how to optimize the budget. And when I speak about the optimization, I mean not just cutting the costs, it's the finding the balance between your goals and the money you have. So what are the possible steps? First, start preparation as early as possible. I, to I told you about two months, so you can uh, start even earlier. The thing is that uh, the closer you are to the date of the event, so the date X, the higher will be the prices for everything. The second one is having fewer contractors. Say you would like to have a photo, you would like to have video and the stream. You can order them from uh, one company and get a discount. Uh, the third one is to look around. Uh, imagine the situation that a colleague of you just bought a copter and he will be super happy to make some common photos for you and you will um, have no need to pay for the photographer. And the last but not the least, but I think it's underestimated one is the barter. Has everyone from here tried barter for some services? I expected this, actually, but that's a very nice um, way because, uh, first of all, you find the company that has the same audience that um, are expected to be your participants, and you take their products, for example, their coffee or their souvenirs, or, for example, it can be the business, uh, it can be the printing cards, so you can take the business cards from them, uh, and the, you gave them um, the place where they can advertise their services. So it's mutually beneficial and it costs you nothing and you can save money. So, uh, the next step is the venue. Venue is super important because it works for the goals. And my question to you is, how do you think, why do we organize telematics here at Gurtum office? Any ideas? Come on, people, you have to have some ideas. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, we can, uh, the participants can see how cool our office is. Yes, partly, but not the main one. Any other ideas? Oh, I thought you will tell me about saving money. I think that's the most obvious one. And this is also yes, but not the main one. The whole team are here, very nice point. Uh, actually, the main idea is that what we communicate here in Gurtum is our openness and the society. So that is why we decided to have at least two days uh, here at Gurtum office and we already knew that we will have queues during lunch, the air condition will be like super busy, uh, but we want to communicate that we are the open company, that's why we do this door open days, so you can go to any department, you can talk to any person, we don't hide anything, so you are absolutely free to talk with any person. So that is why we decided to do it here and of course save a bit of money. Uh, another example. How do you think? What is this in the picture? Sorry? Overcrowded, Overcrowded something. Okay, any other ideas? The lights. Hmm? The lighting. The lighting, okay. Well, what, what kind of event is this? How do you think? I think it was uh, South America conference, yes. Exactly, absolutely. That's a pity that I don't have the price, but <laughs> we can talk about this later. Absolutely, that's the Latin American conference we had this year. So imagine, 
130 people, like a rather huge one, uh, all gathered together, like very nice atmosphere, very nice speeches. And then we saw the venue, and the ceiling was like 2.3 meters high, like this. Just imagine, we are sitting here in Minsk and we are planning the event. We searched the internet, uh, we had the pool of venues, so we find one the city center with nice food and nice fortress, and then we came and saw this ceiling like this. That was super tricky. So that's, m that's why uh, my piece of advice here, please check every location yourself. Don't believe the internet. It's never again example. Uh, here is the checklist. So imagine that you have um, found the venue. The ceiling is uh, of the good uh, heights. Uh, and now you need to speak with the venue. So what you should discuss? Firstly, you should discuss the event date and time, then start and finish time, then the number of participants and how uh, should they sit, then the program, so the time of the breaks, uh, the time of lunch and start and finish time. Uh, then uh, the question about food and beverages, how would it be organized? So my advice here is to book the venue, the hotel, and that is why there will be the catering service, so you don't need to outsource it from the street. Um, will the crowd be divided into groups? So if it will be divided, maybe you need the other kinds of room. So it's also an important one to discuss with the venue. Uh, equipment. Of course, if you take your equipment, um, the venue should know about this too. Uh, and the contacts of the venue representatives, because you're usually uh, exchanging the emails, but phone is also important. Uh, if you're doing an event in the hotel, so you can have two benefits here. The first one is visa support, because if you are um, inviting people from abroad, the hotel can help you with visa and the branded pen and notebooks. It may sound silly, but it's a good kind of optimization of your budget. Uh, the things that are always forgotten. Security guys. So it's good to know whether there are security guys or not, because if there will be an extreme situation, they will definitely help. Transfers. Uh, the hotel may provide you with a free transfer, um, and it also, it's also good. Parking. And is it charged? Uh, just imagine the situation that you have an event in the hotel, in the city center, and parking is not free, and nobody knows about this. So uh, the, your participants come and they have to pay. Not a nice situation. The discharge rate, so if you decided to cancel, how much will you lose? Um, and is the room easy to reach or not? Because if it's not easy to reach, you need to do the map in advance like this one. Uh, and you have probably seen that you have the map of Gurtum office here yeah, because the navigation in our office is not so clear too. Oh, very nice animation. Uh, once again about the venue, I think that's a good idea to make one day seminar, one day prior the major events like the exhibitions for example, and there are for two reasons for this. The first one, it's much easier to invite people because they still have two reasons to come. The first one is the exhibition and the second one is the seminar. Uh, and the second one is low rates, so uh, you can get the lower rates uh, for the rooms at the exhibition halls. Uh, the seating is also very important. Um, do you recognize the pictures? So where was that done? Where were they done? <laughs> oh, come on, you don't recognize it? Yeah, it's here, absolutely. But just have a look. For example, this left one. So it's the speech, it's the monologue. Um, so we're just delivering information, so that is why everyone's sitting is theater-wise, like this, uh, because it's nice to share the ideas, but it's not really supposed to be shared. I mean, that is the monologue, so we're delivering speech like this. Uh, and this is the group work. So everyone's sitting in the round, because we need to share the ideas, we need the ideas to flow, we need to exchange the ideas, so that's why we sit in the round. Absolutely same uh, room, but different purposes. We are in the middle, so uh, we are now at the process of creating the program. So the program, it's the template you can use. Uh, basically, it's all, uh, also one day seminar with the two coffee breaks and the lunch. So you can play with this and use it. Uh, the sixth and the very important step is the participants. And of course, when you think about the participants, you think about your future clients, you think about the leads, but there are three more groups. 
is the speakers, the journalists, and your colleagues. But of course, let's talk about the clients first. How to invite the clients? It can be an email newsletter, so it can be the mass communication, it can be the personal invitation, so the calling or mails, the signature to business development manager's letters, as we do it in Gurtem, and it really works, the website announcements or the blog post or exhibition website, if you do it one day prior to the exhibition, media announcement or press releases, we will talk about this a bit later, uh, and your personal pages in social media. Uh, a question that I usually get, is search engine optimization uh, useful or do we need to do this? And my, the answer is no, uh, because it usually takes like two months for Google to see the changes at your website, so it can be too late. So, okay, now we know how to get uh, the participants, but where to head them, where to head the traffic. The simplest uh, thing is a nicely designed PDF. So it's like super simple, uh, but you can share it and it's also a good source of information. The second one is the website news post. So you take one news post, update it all the time, and it's become like a small website about your conference. Another example is the landing page. Uh, probably you have seen the landing page for the telematics conference. Uh, so it can be done inside the corporate website or outside like it's done in our situation. So the idea is that uh, this website should, should answer two questions. Why should they go and how should they get there? So why should they go is the reason, it's about the selling part, it's about what Olga just discussed with you. And the second why is how to get there. And uh, here I mean not just the address of the venue but also how to apply the application process. Uh, social media event can also be a very nice addition, but it's not obligatory, it's a nice bonus. The aim is to warm up uh, the participants before the event, so you can share the information, you can share uh, the biographies of the speakers, some key points of their presentations, you can answer the questions. So if you have time, just do it, that's nice. Uh, the second group is the speakers. And you know that a good speaker is a passport to success. The good like this one. <laughs> Uh, so the question is, uh, who can be the speaker? So the first one is the experts, um, like for example, somebody from Gurtem, or for example, Gurtem partners from your region, or some hardware manufacturers, or even your big clients. Uh, the second idea is public authorities. They are also good and journalists really love them. Uh, the third is professional conference in the sphere. You just open any professional conference in your sphere, look through agenda and see who's speaking there and invite them. And of course, you. How to work with the speaker? So say you found the speaker, uh, you got the agreement, what's next? Formulate the conditions of his or her participation. So the date, the time, the time slot, specific name of the speech and get the approval. Better the written one. Uh, if you organize the transfer or accommodation for the speaker, please share the details in advance. Yes, yeah, specify the travel details. So uh, if you don't do this, the transfer from the airport can be a very nice step. It will show uh, your respect, your appreciation, and it's pretty cheap. And we, we know it can be done by the hotel. You pay nothing. Uh, contact details, not only email is also important. Uh, please share the presentation template uh, and also ask uh, to share the presentation in advance so you can check it and you can make the hard copy. Uh, and also don't forget to say thank you, to share the letter or to share the certificate with the speakers because it's nice, it costs you nothing. Uh, the next category is journalists. Uh, even if you have never worked with a journalist, I will share some pieces of advice and if you need more information, you can go to marketing department, find Irina, who is, super exp exp uh, who is our PR manager and has a lot of experience with dealing with the journalists, so she will tell you more. Uh, but here is express course for the PR managers. So first you need to create the list of the relevant regional, um, so, uh, regional media, so it can be the magazines, the newspapers and the website find their contacts. If you don't see the contacts of the website, no problem. You see who are the authors of the articles you like, the articles on your topic, and find them in their social media. The thing is that they are public persons, so uh, it will be not um, difficult to find the information about them. 
Uh, the next one, you write a press release, or better, three press releases. The idea behind is that uh, with every step, with every new press release, you uh, give and provide more and more information. So the first one could be a short announcement with the date and the super brief agenda. The second one uh, can be the same, but you add the comments of one speaker or, for example, the statistics or the results of the research you've done. And the third one uh, should be a mailing with the brief points from the speakers, so the journalists can use this already. Then you do three flights of communication, so you, you distribute this press release. Uh, you got the approvals from the journalists and send the confirmation. Uh, then you prepare a small souvenir or a gift for journalists. Yes, it still works. Uh, and after the event finishes, you are ready with the press release. You are ready with the good resolution photos. You are ready with the comments. Uh, so basically, journalist has no job to do. He just posts it. Uh, what about the speakers? There are three categories of speakers uh, that are very valuable for the journalist. So the first one is, of course, the officers from the ministry in charge, uh, who are the decision makers. So be sure that if you have a speaker like this, you will have a pool of journalists too. Uh, representatives of the expert communities. So it can be entrepreneurs, representatives of professional unions, so the guys who know the topic. Uh, and the last but not the least, public persons and representatives of the trade unions. They are also valuable for your event. Uh, and the last one is your employees, it's your team. Because uh, at the very end, the impression of your event is the impression from your employees too. Uh, and there are basically three kinds of stuff you have. The one that are directly connected with your organization, uh, the one who are connected with the content uh, and uh, also the program, and the third one who are dealing and speaking with the customers but are not really involved in the first and the second part. What is important here? All of them should, be, uh, should know their roles definitely and better in advance. All of them need to be instructed separately. Uh, all of them need to have clear understanding how their work is connected with the work of other people, uh, what respons responsibilities they have and how they are connected to the other responsibilities. And also they should be warned in advance, I'd say two months in advance at least. Uh, the good thing that the older one can teach the newer ones, so it will bond the people, it will, will be a very good uh, team building. Okay, that was good. It will be a very good team building uh, and, and uh, it will create the new unions because the old uh, employees are okay while the new one will be like blind kittens. You don't want them to spoil your event. So then you define the checkpoints uh, and then you let your employees know uh, in what time they can approach you, so if they are stuck on the way, uh, they need to know that you will help them. Uh, and also you need to have a common meeting, like two, three days prior to the event, just to double check that everyone is, knows their roles, that everything is ready. The contractors is the last step, but also very important. There are plenty of them, but uh, probably you will definitely have the hotel service or the catering, because you will need to have food and the printing house. How to work with the contractor? Everyone knows that it's super difficult to find the good contractor, but anyway, there is a set of steps and there is a set of things you need to bear in mind while speaking with the contractor. So first of all, put all the results of the negotiations on the paper uh, before the work process started. The second one, do the timing. Uh, based not only on your desires, but uh, also on the possibilities and interests of the second side. And monitor the level of the prices, so it will make the organization process easier. Uh, never pay before signing the documents. Book in advance. Uh, search for the recommendations and reviews to make the best choice. Um, and also uh, try to have uh, the context of the decision maker from the contractor side, because if you have some extreme situations, if you have some problems, it will be easier to solve them with the high-level manager. Uh, and please, never agree on the offers like, today we do it for free, but you will see how good we are. 
So uh, that's a special offer for you. No, no, and no. It will never work, and you will never get the good quality. Uh, the catering is very important, so uh, basically my advice is to order it from the hotel because it will be much easier for you. Uh, and also uh, a thing to have is the participants package, so the minimum uh, content is the page, agenda, and the participant certificate. Uh, it's also good to add a pen, a notebook, uh, and a small souvenir, so maybe a set of stickers. By the way, have you seen our stickers from the conference? They are in your bags, and we find them very nice. <laughs> uh, sweets or the bracelets, something like this. Um, uh, the last thing I would like to tell you is that uh, you, can prepare, you can be prepared in 100%, so you'll make sure that everything works, that every employee knows what's going on. You have distributed all the roles, but there will be risks and there will be problems, definitely, because it's the organization of the event. So that is why I would like to discuss with you some points. For example, what will you do when you have the sudden power cut or a blackout in the middle of your conference or a one-day seminar? How do you think? Candles. Hmm? Candles. candles, yeah, very nice idea. Something else? Start the party earlier. Yeah, start the party earlier. That's a good idea. So, for example, um, you can think, do you really need a microphone? So maybe you have a small group discussion and you don't need it. Um, is it possible to continue without the slides? In some cases, it's absolutely possible. Maybe it's possible to have the group discussion. So you will sit in a very nice round and discuss. Like, it will be okay even without electricity. Or maybe it's possible to go to the coffee break earlier. In some cases, it's possible. The next one, the key speaker is late. How do you think, what will you do? Are we allowed to cry? Yeah, oh, that's a good, that's a good answer in every situation. First you cry and then you think, what will I do? Okay, what would I propose is firstly to specify, like, what's the delay? Uh, what time will he come? How big is the delay? And then you think, maybe you can start later, or maybe you can change with the other speaker. So there are plenty of ideas. Uh, the materials are late. So what would you do? So, Kirill, what would you do? Imagine you're organizing the telematic conference and all the materials are late. So, um, it doesn't matter for me anymore because I'll be fired for this. Uh, <laughs> so. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What would I propose is, for example, when your agenda is late, you can share the e-version so everyone... We have the Wi-Fi, so everyone could probably check on their mobile phone and it will be okay. Or for example, when the souvenirs or the presents are late, we know all your addresses, so we will distribute them by post. So it's okay. And the last one that breaks my heart, a box of, sh a box of champagne is smashed to atoms. What could be the solution? Buy a new year, another one. Okay, that's probably the easy one. So you need to have the catering number in advance, so if you have this extreme situation, you know what to do immediately, so they can immediately replace. Or if no, maybe you'll have a non-alcoholic party. That could also be an option. Uh, okay, what's next? So imagine you have done a perfect, well-organized seminar, but it's not the end. <laughs> and Olga will tell you what's next. It's never an end. So yeah, imagine you've had the best event ever. You've managed to talk to many people, to many potential customers, to existing customers. You've gathered lots of information. So what's next? I do not wish to sound too dramatic here, but sometimes after the conference part would require even more involvement from you and your team, even more work than uh, in more efforts than you used to make uh, before the seminar. So I would suggest uh, dividing those kind of activities into those activities that should be done prior to the seminar and then after the seminar. If you skip the activities that should be done before the seminar, all the activities after the seminar are going to be ruined in one way or another. So here on this timeline you see that we suggest you instructing your team how to work uh, at the seminar, basically how to communicate to customers, how to take notes and stuff like that. Anastasia has already mentioned that. 
Also, you should specify the dead deadlines for your workers in advance. Again, they need some time to adjust and to understand their fate. Um, and then after the seminar, you're going to need to follow up with the uh, seminar participants, get feedback, and share it uh, with your colleagues. So speaking about your own employees and how you're supposed to teach them how to make notes, how to communicate with your customers, I'm going to speak about some techniques or practices that work for us in most cases. However, we also have a couple of methods that do not work for us and which we do not recommend. At the same time, this is our own unique experience. What is not working for us may work for you, so please choose those pieces of advice wisely. Um, when speaking um, about making notes, you might notice that when some of Gertem employees are talking to you, they're actually having a notebook and they're making some notes. Uh, it's done on purpose. We punish people if they don't make notes, and um, it's not a joke. You can ask some people from my team. So we recommend to take notes um, because an, a human brain is a human brain. If you have two, three, four, five conversations in a row, all the major details of the first one will be gone for good. Um, so uh, we're asking all our people to make notes. If that's a new employee, we're asking him to make notes uh, right during the conversation. If that's an older employee, uh, he's asked to make notes right after the conversation. Why there is this difference? For a new guy, for a new girl, um, the whole event like that would be a huge stress and people will uh, hear many new names, details, and they will not remember even half of that. So uh, in our experience, the only way to prevent natural information loss is to ask people to write down uh, the way, uh, right when they speak and ask as many questions as possible. If that's like an older employee, who has great experience, then he could keep some more information inside of his head and can lead the notes after the conversation. One more piece of advice that we would love to share is that it helps speaking in pair. For example, if there are two employees, one is leading the conversation, the other one is making notes. It also helps people to take notes because normally, especially new employees, they're kind of freaked out that people will not react nicely if you make notes in front of them. In my experience, most people don't care, they don't mind, and even if they freak out, you can simply say that I'm making notes to send you a follow-up afterwards, and I don't want to forget all those important pieces of information, and that would be good. One more technique that worked for us, it's related to the technique of writing reports. Um, basically, we provide all the employees with a perfect report example, like uh, you have an older employee who wants written a very good piece of information and you send it to your employees, okay, this is the example that you should follow. However, it's not the end, it, this is just the beginning. After you have shared the report, it's critically important to talk to your employee and say, okay, what do you think is so perfect about this example? And trust me when I say, the younger your employee is, the more ridiculous versions you will hear. So after that, you will have to talk to them and explain, okay, what is good about this report is this, this, and this. And you should follow that kind of pattern. It's important that you explain to your people what kind of result you expect from them. If you do not do that, if you skip that part, then you don't have any right to judge your employees or to fire them or whatever. There are also some practices or methods that do not work for us. For example, I know that some people are making audio recordings with the purpose of re-listening to the conversations and then making notes. Again, in our experience, that's not really time-wise. Uh, your phone may crash, the audio recording could be bad, plus sometimes, uh, let's say, recording other people with it, without their knowledge could be creepy and even illegal in some countries, so this is something that you would probably like to skip. And the second technique that we try to avoid, or if to be more precise, we try to use it only in specific situations, it's questionnaires that you have in papers. For example, there is this question and there is some blanket space where you have to write down the answer of your customer or potential customer. Um, those questionnaires work perfectly fine for some standardized conversations for some types of workers, but if you have smart employees, trust me, they're going to have a conversation of their own and they don't need those kind of limits. They will perform everything and they will do everything greatly. Uh, 
one example when you actually can use the questionnaires, for example, the cases when you cannot have the original conversation, for example, there are like three people standing in your queue and you need to talk to everyone, but you understand that physically it's impossible, then you can handle the questionnaire and receive some answers. But if you can have the original conversation, you should have the original conversation because you will benefit from it more. And uh, there will always be some people who will forget those questionnaires in some inappropriate places. And sometimes they contain quite security sensitive information, which you do not need to be lost anywhere. And the lazy ones will always ask uh, the customers to fill those questionnaires in for them. And they again will skip the conversation. Again, not a nice practice for us. One more thing that you need to do before the seminar is specifying the deadlines. It would depend on what kind of worker it is, uh, what your objectives are. For Gurtam, uh, we specify normally approximately a month for writing a report, and let's say one or two weeks for following up with uh, seminar participants. Uh, we think that um, stats and reports can wait, while real people will not wait, so you need to follow up as soon as possible within the reasonable timeline. Uh, one more important thing that we would like to speak about here is uh, the need to log in this information to some kind of CRM or Excel or whatever the, the document you're having about the customer. For example, this is the screenshot from our own corporate CRM, which we are developing at Gertam. Of course, it's not blurry in our CRM. We have just made this screenshot to protect some information about the customer. But as you can see here, uh, you have uh, an understanding. This, this is the meeting that happened at Global Sources Expo in Hong Kong. This is the date of the comment. This is the author. The author is Anna. Uh, this is the type is meeting, some priority stars. Uh, you can see the partner name and names of people who participated from the partner company. And again, you have the original comment where you have some things that you should do or specify in your follow-up email. It's critically important, again, to log in and save this information. First of all, it will help you to evaluate how well your workers perform. Second of all, you will have to keep it for future generations in one way or another. And the last thing about the deadlines. Um, when you're setting up the deadlines, it's, it would help you a lot if you could evaluate the current workload of your employees and try, at least try, to set up the deadlines in accordance uh, with their workload. And also then you will probably have to negotiate those kind of deadlines with them, because if you don't do that, at least if you don't give people a chance to say something about the deadlines, uh, after the conference you will hear such comments that those deadlines are unrealistic, they were set up without our knowledge, we did not know about them in advance and stuff like that. So you don't need those kind of fights after the seminar, you will be pretty tired yourself and all the people will be tired too. And again, after um, the seminar, we can agree on the following uh, sequence of actions. It's when you're selling to a potential customer or to an existing customer. I'm not going to read it aloud because some of you might have visited already the training from Dennis. Uh, basically, those are universal steps that you follow if you want to close the deal. Uh, one more thing that you do after the seminar. Remember we were speaking about the difference between a goal and an objective? So here it's high time you remembered your goals and you remembered your objectives because they will serve as evaluation criteria at this stage. For example, if your main goal was to build a pool of loyal customers, you might want to see in the next couple of months or in the next couple of years how many uh, of your customers stay with you if they participated in the seminar. Is it a good ratio, bad ratio? Or perhaps you had quite a controversial relationship with some of your customers and it, it improved after the seminar. This is also possible because you had a personal connection. Or if you're working towards an, ex like an expansion of your existing customer base and you're looking for new customers, you may want to analyze how many new customers you generated after the seminar after six or 12 months or even two years. Of course, provided they also participated in the original seminar. Mm. Okay, one more thing, which is normally neglected. Uh, you got to sh uh, get the feedback, and you got to get the feedback both from your participants and from your own employees. It's critically important, again, because those two groups will view the event differently from different angles. It's like two sides of the coins. Your participants will see one side and your employees will see a different side. Which is why the feedback, the ratings that you may receive from those two audiences could be completely different and this is totally normal because again, everyone is looking from a different angle. 
And last but not the least, once you have collected the feedback, it's important to share it with your colleagues. Um, it, it, sometimes it's hard to believe, but almost all the people who you meet in your life, they all want to improve, they all want to do a quality job. And they want to receive the feedback on their own work too. So once you've gathered uh, some ratings of your event, you could share it with, with your colleagues and uh, they will be happy to receive those comments because they want to improve and they want to become better next year. So those are the steps that we suggest you take after uh, your conference, after your seminar. Um, I hope that you found out some, something useful from this one hour of training. And um, one last question before we all go. Um, does anyone want to organize a one-day seminar right after this training? Uh, I basically, I, I, I have a question to ask you about your opinion and, and uh, shoot and it's connected to what you said uh, basically in matter of uh, seminars one day seminars uh, what you think about uh, let's say in the uh, first thing uh, about ideas of mix and match for example mm -hmm. organizing seminars for clients of insurance in matter of uh, driver behavior and technology and possibility Mm -hmm. like mixing organization with insurance company to organize that for their customers mm -hmm. from one side mm -hmm. or organizing a seminar about uh, influence of telematics to insurance uh, to our customers mm -hmm. with, uh, with calling those insurance guys mm -hmm. to tell them more about possibilities but mm -hmm. let's say to uh, somebody else to speak about it, not to speak, not us to speak to our clients, mm -hmm. to to bring some insurance specialists to speak about telematics. Mm -hmm. And and second thing, uh, what do you think about? Uh, from my experience, I know that people usually like it. Never mind, they are our customers. They would always like, for example, to see uh, somebody from our supplier side, mm -hmm. like, like uh, seminar. A short seminar one day uh, where Gurtam guys would explain some something to, about technology and mm -hmm. possibilities and things like that. Those two things, what you think about them? Okay, uh, the first thing, I want to make sure that I got your idea correctly. It's like we're organizing uh, the one-day seminar where we invite insurance companies, where we invite I integrators, no? No, it's from our perception. We are, we are much smaller mm -hmm. than Gurtam. At least uh, my company is much smaller. Mm -hmm. And let's say in matter of organizing seminars, mm -hmm. it's, it is always question about uh, credibility and trust. Mm -hmm. Because if we are calling our customers or potential customers, it's normal for them to expect for something will be, uh, we are selling something to yes, them. It's yes. completely normal. Mm -hmm. But it's always good when you, if you move that line a bit left or right, mm -hmm. and if perception is, that the insurance company calling their customers mm -hmm. to tell them something about telematics, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Or if we are calling our customers to tell them something about insurance. It is more about topic of seminar, about uh, team, about uh, what is all about. It's more about that. Okay, I think it always makes sense to organize uh, a one-day seminar, uh, again, if you understand clearly your goal and you have the appropriate content. Again, depending on your goal, you will define the content and the speakers and stuff like that. We have already some um, integrators, some VLAN integrators who organize those kind of conferences, either for their potential customers or for uh, existing ones. For example, our integrator from uh, Belarus, I think, organizes some kind of event like that, and it works fine for them. Uh, so yes, why not? I also know that uh, there should be like oh, there's one partner from Europe who organizes those kind of events for their sub dealers. Again, why not? In, in, if I can ask, in matter of organization of those things, because it's a like dual organization. If you're co-organizing with somebody, did you have such experiences, and could it be problematic because of that? If you try to organize, for example, with supplier or with uh, distributor or with uh, some partner company together seminar? In our experience, your supplier should have some kind of policy how they work on cases like that. 
um, because if you're just the only one who approaches, I don't know, Gertem and ask Gertem to uh, cooperate on the organizational side, then probably us will be at a loss if we don't have any policy at hand. Currently, like, we have a policy at hand, and Sasha wants to say something about it. Uh, so um, it's always a good idea to approach your supplier and ask what, how you can help us, because if they have a policy like implemented, they will provide you with some kind of assistance. We already have that kind of policy, and we keep improving it. So yeah, why not? Thank you. And I think there was the second part of the question. Um, like, uh, if anyone is willing to invite Gertsam to participate in their seminars as a speaker, this is totally possible. You just need to let us know in advance because everyone has pretty, a pretty tough schedule. But again, we can send some people. And this is something that we already do from our partners from the CIS region because they're closer, so it's a bit easier, so to say. But we're open. We are always ready to send our people if you're organizing a seminar and want to impress everyone with the big brother. Thanks. Sasha, you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, Alexander Smirno. Uh, so I wanted to add that the uh, co-organization uh, co might, uh, first of all, it's important to understand the audience that we are going to work, whether it's going to be end customer or it's going to be the insurances as they will be reselling further. Then the kind of support would be, might be like financial support. We co-sponsor in terms of the funds. So we look at that as an opportunity for you to get new leads. And we discuss the budget. And then this budget is uh, weighted against the marketing events that you're going to uh, uh, use there. Second thing would be for sure a presentation from the supplier. But it might not be the supplier itself. And uh, third thing, the personal uh, presence uh, is, uh, you know, in order to underline the value of the proposition that it lies not only in the product itself, but also on the people that will be taking care of the solution for the end. Okay. Thank okay, you. so uh, again, last question. Who th now thinks that doing a one-day seminar is totally doable and feasible? Raise your hand. Please inspire us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Again, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask Anastasia or me. Anastasia has clearly a bit more experience than I do. Uh, just this year, she organized more than 12 events already. So feel free to ask for our recommendations and assistance. Thank you.